people love serialized content from TV shows like Friends and The X-Files to podcasts like Dirty John and movies like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. B2B companies can tap into this obsession by creating serialized content. Today, Ian Faison, founder of Caspian Studio, shares his serialized content framework for B2B. In this Marketing Pops episode, you learn, first of all, why serialized content is effective in B2B marketing. Second, the five pillars of great B2B content series. Third, an example of a successful B2B podcast series. And number four, Ian's career power. Are you ready? Let's go. Marketing Power Ups. Ready? Go! Here's your host, Rambly John. Ian, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be talking about a serialized content framework. I really love it. I'm a big fan of podcasts and video. And also, like, I've been checking out some of Caspian Studios' show, like Murder in HR. We're going to talk about that. Like, that's just, like, absolutely fun. Like, it's, like, stuff that B2B marketers and B2B marketing teams aren't doing as much as they should be, especially with AI. Like, you know, like, oh, now AI is going to come and, like, you can you can write content. But it, stuff like this is something that uh, even it, I believe, you know, creativity is going to be more and more important with it. I mean, let's dig in. Let's talk about serialized content first. Like, why why is it so effective? And, like, I mean, I'm asking two questions here. But, like, why is it so effective and why should B2B marketers care about this? About, like, um, serialized content that's in series? Yeah, I um. You know, I was, I was recently listening to uh, an interview with one of the founders of of Marvel Studios, mm-hmm. and and he was talking about how when they did the math back before Marvel was Marvel, like before the you know when it was just comic books and toys and things like that, and he was talking about how if you look at how hard it is to bring a movie to market, extremely difficult, right? But way, way, way easier to bring a sequel to market. And so I think in B2B, if we were to look at what we've been doing for a long time is just bringing single, you know, one-off type content over and over and over and over and over again. And every time you got to refine an audience for it, every time you got to market that thing, every time you got to do that, it's like just way harder to do that. Whereas if you build a series, you can promote episode one, you can promote episode seven, you can promote episode like 25 but it all funnels back to that series and you can build an audience over time. You know, there's a great uh, Coca-Cola adage that they used to use back in the day. It's like Coke isn't trying to get its hardcore Coke drinkers to to drink more Coke. What they're trying to do is to get you to drink one Coke a year if you don't drink Coke, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's like the way that we should be thinking about marketing is if you build a series and you build a bunch of inroads to your series, if someone comes and listens to one episode a month or one episode a year or whatever it is, um, and they start to know, like, and trust you, like, that's a really big win. And hopefully they become a subscriber. You know, hopefully they listen to five seconds and then a minute and then, you know, two minutes and then a whole episode. And then they, you know, binge the whole back catalog and all that. And that might not always happen. Um, but if you build a series, there's a place for them to subscribe. Uh, there's a place for them to uh, to continually get that information. And, you know, in sales, you know, it's confusion equals no sale. Well, in marketing, it's the same exact thing. And so if you build a series, the very clear premise, what like we at Caspian Studios called like the promise to the listener, if you're going to build that promise and deliver on that promise every single episode, then they know what they're getting and it's much easier to build an audience that way. And so uh, I think that like, what I wanted to do in in writing the serialized content framework was to just like, even though it's a very wordy, sort of silly uh, title, was to figure out like how people can build serialized content, whether that's like podcasts or video series or shows or events or whatever it is that can bring people back uh, over and over and over again that are interested in that sort of thing without having to like recreate the wheel every single time mm-hmm. to create more one-off content. And so that was the sort of goal of it. And, uh, and as we studied a bunch of B2B companies that are doing this really well, we found that, um, you know, that they've been able to build audiences. And then when you study like non-B2B, when you study Hollywood, when you study Marvel Studios, what they did with the MCU, when you study what, um, you know, what all, all of these sequels, why they've, why they've done this is that, you know, the data shows that it's much easier to do that. So, uh, we're trying to take our cues from Hollywood, trying to take our cues from, uh, B2C and take our cues from, uh, people that are building really good stuff. 
uh, and trying to infuse that back into into our B2B marketing a little bit. I, I love that so much. The other thing that from, from the audience point of view, like sometimes, especially with B2B, specifically for B2B, it takes longer to purchase something sometimes where, you know, you can involve multiple people at the same time, you know, multiple stakeholders within the same team. And you're building that relationship over time rather than like, hey, here's here's content and then that's it versus this like they keep coming back so that when they are ready to purchase they're like what was that podcast like i was listening to ian about that show like i should go check out like you know what they're doing what they're up to what they're selling because now they've kind of built that relationship over over time through through the serialized content is it's probably another benefit that you need to be companies have with this yeah for sure i mean it it goes back to like no like and trust, right? They have to know you, uh, then they have to like you, and then they have to trust you. And if they do know you, um, and if they do like you, and if they do trust you, they're much more likely to buy from you. And I think that most of the time, like a one-off blog, for example, is not really going to get someone to know, like, or trust you. Maybe they know you by the fact that they're going to, you know, from an SEO standpoint, like stumble across your website, Maybe they're going to read that and say, hey, this is pretty good. But at the current, like where we're at, if you stumble across a blog um, and you're like, this is pretty helpful, you're probably just going to close out and go on to the next thing. You know, <laughs> yeah. I think the stat is like of people convert. So one in one in 400, you know, people convert. Right. Yeah. And so uh, that's really hard. That's a really hard sort of like conversion number um, for like a one off blog post. But if you were to do a series where you still have that same conversion number, um, but you you know build this thing out over time and you can bring people back over and over and over again, um, then that conversion rate is going to go you know up a ton. Um, mm-hmm. And the other piece of like serialized content, which I think people don't really um, understand, is that which is so obvious when you say it, but like meet your customer where they are, right? Like meet these people mm. where they are. And if they want to be on Spotify, you should meet them on Spotify. If they want to be on YouTube, you got to meet them on YouTube. If they want to be on Apple Podcasts or if they want to read your information in, a, in an email newsletter, then that's where you got to do it. Where they're really not is just cruising around your website on your blog. Like oh, wow. they're just not yeah. doing that. Like people don't right. do that. Um, and so it's silly to even try to like reverse engineer this process that doesn't work. Whereas where they are spending their time in LinkedIn scrolling around on, you know, Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or, um, or, you know, in, in feeds, you know, listening to uh, a podcast while they're walking their dog or, you know, have a YouTube uh, video on in the background while they're working. Like if you meet them in those places, then you're much more likely to uh, to win the day, and and I think that a lot of people are sort of just making stuff that is not uh, not designed for those mediums, and then the listener or the reader, or the viewer just tunes out and is like, "This isn't this isn't sort of for me." I love that. That reminds me of uh, a story you told when you know your your uh, story of how Caspian Studio started, where like you were talking about mentors. You're like, uh, I'm going to go to meet with Apple. And then you're like, I'm, I'm going to meet with, um, I need to like listen to my mentor. And your uh, men- the mentor was a podcast episode. Right. And I, I love that because like, you're not, you know, maybe you're going to read a blog post before you, you do the pitch, but you're going to go back to something that you listened to in the past and maybe refer to it to, to get that hype. And that's the other, I think, benefit to this is that you said no, like, and trust, but that trust piece is so important and that you know building a relationship over time they start seeing whoever the host or the whoever uh, is in that show uh, as a mentor almost especially if it's something that they're sharing to establish their their credibility and their you know their expertise around the topic um there was an interesting thing that happened um i was listening to a uh, pretty famous podcaster and they were saying that when they used to do radio that they were sort of had a celebrity status that it was like they were sort of like a radio dj sort of a thing right like they 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 would get seen places and they're like oh my gosh the celebrity and then when they transitioned to podcasting and they did a podcast for a long time that people would just come up to them in the street like they knew them what? so they would just come up and be like oh hey how's it going it's like do i know you it's like, oh no, I've just been listening to your podcast for years. And they know all this information about them. They know all that stuff. And I think that that's like such a really important data point for marketers because the idea that someone would feel comfortable enough to come up to you 
and like like they know you it just shows mm. how intimate the medium is right like someone yeah. is speaking directly into your ears and 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 there's a big that we could go like i could go on and on and on about podcasting in general because there's all sorts of interesting things that happened that sort of led to this but one of the big things is is just the change in technology with like uh airpods that it's like now you have this super easy way to just like you know, throw in an AirPod, continue listening where you left off. And that person is just like talking into your, into your brain. Right. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, again, it's just, it's just a much more intimate medium. Um, and so that's why you see, you know, a lot of, uh, success with that stuff. And I think, you know, all this to say, um, it's really hard to build a B2B podcast, right? You are mm. competing with all sorts of, uh, you know, different, um, other types of shows that are, uh, frankly, usually a lot better than yours, whether it's like, you're, if you're <clears throat> quote unquote competing with smartless, right. For like, quote unquote, you know, ear time or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, they're professional comedians. They're way better at their job. They have a bigger team. They have more producers. Their content is always going to be better than yours. Always. But you have something that they don't have on the smartless team or Joe Rogan or, or whoever is, you know, your audience better than they ever could. Mm. And so that's a huge advantage for you to say, like, if I'm making a podcast for, you know, developers uh, or, you know, whatever, like UI designers or something like that, I know them better. So I can make things that are much more tailored, that are much more interesting for those for those people. And usually what happens is when someone goes to make something, they sort of just like go 50% or they, you know, make something good enough and they don't go sort of the extra mile. And like at Caspian, what we talk about all the time is like, you know, there's no traffic on the extra mile. If you go the extra mile, if you make the show that's so good for that audience, that's delivering so much value to them, um, and you do that over and over and over and over again, can, you know, um, you know, consistently um, and repeatedly, like you can have a lot of success. And that's where you can sort of, you know, win, win the, the mind share or the ear share or whatever of, of an audience and to make something that's actually like, you know, edutaining them um, rather than, rather than just sort of like, you know, spitting some, some stats at them in a, in a blog post. Yeah. And that's the other thing that's super interesting. Um, you know, when you were talking about like the extra mile, I'm thinking about like murder in HR and like hacker chronicles. Can you talk a little bit about like how how did that? You can choose either one of them or both. Like, how did it come about? And like, you're you know, it's totally out there. Something that I've never heard. Usually, when I think about B two B podcasts, it's like let's get the founder or the the CMO or whatever to interview a bunch of folks, and we're gonna publish it, and we're gonna you know we're gonna be sound like experts. But like, there's a ton of interview related podcasts out there. But like when when I heard of murder in HR, I'm like. Dude, this is this is the future. Like, can you talk about yeah. that? Like, how did that come about? And like, uh, you know, it, it got got that out there. Yeah, I so in the book in Serialized Content Framework, um, I have this little graph that I call the edutainment graph, and basically it has uh, the x-axis is um, educational or entertaining, and the y-axis is is educational. It shows how good I am in math that I know the. We even which is X and which is Y axis. Um, but uh, anyways, and so what I sat down and did sort of a number of years ago was sort of try to figure out what would it take to get in the top right quadrant? Mm. Like what could we create that actually is entertaining for a B2B audience? And what could we create that is actually educational at the same time? Like, it's a very hard thing to do. And so, like, how can we create something? And so what we did, and I'll use murder and HR as an example of this. So what we looked at was basically the, the three most popular genres in podcasting are essentially like what I call murder stories, but basically like either true crime or murder mystery type things, mm -hmm. right? So that's very popular. Uh, comedy is very popular. And then for us, like, you know, business content is the, is the third thing, right? So not, not a very popular genre compared to the other two, but popular for, for what we're looking at. Right. And so, so we said, well, it, if we could tell a story that is a mystery that has like a propulsive element to the story, like a mystery is, is very easy, right? Like murder and HR, you hear it and you know, somebody, there's a murder, right? And so we got to introduce the, the detective at the very beginning of the mystery, say, hey, this is our detective. There's a body that's going to drop and this person has to solve it, right? So you know from the first, you know, 30 seconds of listening to this show exactly what you're going to get, 
there's no um there's no uh guessing you know exactly that this is a murder mystery right um and so then we looked at um this murder mystery genre and this comedy genre so how do we infuse comedy into this to make this you know more more entertaining so if you look at some of the really popular mysteries right now if you look at knives out or yeah. only murders in the building for example these are extremely popular uh franchises because they have this um this levity in in the story um and there's and i think people right now crave this type of story i think yeah. that people want to be they like the mystery component to it, but they just want something that they can watch or listen with their spouse or a loved one or a friend and talk about it. And it's lighthearted enough that it's funny and it keeps you smiling. Um, but also there's this sort of, you know, other element to it. So we took those two things and we so, sort of like mapped those together. And then we said, okay, now let's take a business, you know, audience and draw that other concentric circle on there and say, could we make this hyper focus for a very sp specific persona? So we got um, linked up with Jim Pass, and they have an awesome CMO, Ryan Benici, uh, and a bunch of really cool people on their team. And we pitched them this idea of, of this uh, murder mystery set in HR. They sell to HR people. Um, and, uh, you know, they're awesome and they were super gung ho about it, about being, you know, the sponsor and all this other cool stuff. And, uh, you know, and then we sort of, you know, filled out the cast and, you know, filled out the story and, and all those things. And so really like, you know, the, the sort of rest is history and we've done, you know, 1.1 million listeners on the show and it hit number one in, in fiction uh, for all of all podcasts hit number one in fiction, not, not like B2B podcasts or business podcasts, but like of all it. fiction podcasts. Yeah. Uh, I think it was up to like number 36 on the top hundred charts for all podcasts. Wow. So it did it extremely well. It was like commercially very you know, successful in that, in that sense. And, um, uh, and Kate Mara plays the lead. She's amazing. And yeah. Brett Gelman plays uh, her co-star and he's amazing. And it has, has all of these elements and it's funny and it's silly and it's, you know, this ridiculous sort of murder mystery, but we're able to tell all of these HR related things that are hard to do in nonfiction. Yeah. You can't really poke fun at the profession in nonfiction. And you need to be able to expose all of those little secrets and insecurities and idiosyncrasies that like make business ridiculous, but also like where we spend, you know, 40 hours a week of our lives. And so um, what you get is this story that feels like grounded and real in a business mm -hmm. sense, even though the circumstances are super, super insane. Um, and you have something that is like, you could literally listen to with with your mom or you could listen to with your spouse or you could listen to with your colleagues and uh yeah and it, you know and it took off within the hr community and it took off sort of uh you know with it within other audiences and i think that you know we we know that and obviously you know we, we're you know doubling down on that with a bunch of other stuff that we can talk about but but that's sort of like how it all how it all came to be um was just looking at audience and looking at like how we could make something that um that is able to do that that's super cool so what i heard was like you came up with this concept with your team and then you looked at the the categories that are popular podcasts i mean it makes sense like you know what murder stories you, you mentioned and comedy and then business and i and you kind of smashed them together i love that it's like almost remixing like old classics to make them more relevant and that creates something new i forgot this book called like how to steal like a pro <laughs> and it essentially <laughs> talks about like how to take two inspiration and put them together. And that's how you put this uh, pretty much together with murder and HR. Then you went to gym pass. And I guess it's interesting that it's the other way around. Usually, uh, you know, you come to a client or a company and be like, Oh, we want to create a podcast for you. But this is the other way around where you already had a concept. It's very strong. Did you have like the stars already like signed up or were, was that part of the pitch? We're like, we're going to get Kate Mara. And yeah, we knew based off of the size of the budget that we were going to go after, you know, A-list Hollywood talent for sure. Like all of these productions, we, we, you know, we have a budget, you know, it's a sizable budget, you know, like we're, um, you know, these type of productions are 300, 400,000 bucks. So they're, they're, you know, it's not like a cheap production. It's a mm. very high end sort of production and, and a lot of moving parts to be able to deliver that. And it's, 
honestly incredibly complex uh to build a production like this um and there's all sorts of moving parts and it's very difficult so um we didn't have the stars those particular stars but we knew that we wanted a-list talent and we you know we work with uh hollywood agents and all that stuff and and they're amazing um and so uh yeah we you know we 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 pitched the story and and uh <coughs> And luckily, uh, fortunately, that those two uh, amazing actors, in addition to the rest of the you know voice actors that are that were on the cast, which were also amazing, um, were able to uh, to really like the story. And uh, you know, and and I think Jim Pass as a sponsor, you know, it 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 works really well because they want they you know love HR people. Obviously, they're selling into HR, but they want to you know uh, uplift their profession, and they wanted to you know thematically talk about things like toxicity at the work in the workplace yeah. which we were going to talk about on the show so you know it's it's a it was a really good synergy to have them as a sponsor uh and the presenting partner for the entire series um in that way because we believe in the future that they believe uh and we believe that like hr people who are extremely un- misunderstood i used to work in hr um mm. and uh and get treated honestly like crap a lot and so like we wanted to be able to tell a story that shows that they get treated like crap and also you know that uh that they have a such an important job uh to play um you know in in companies so uh yeah you know it it all worked and you know i'll juxtapose that with the hacker chronicles which we created with tenable and that show was very different in the sense that that show uh, was a much lighter brand touch in terms of there wasn't as much product placement in there, mm. but they wanted to tell a very real grounded story of how a hacker be- could become a hacker. Uh, sort of like Breaking Bad, but for like a coffee barista that 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 turns into uh, a cyber criminal and how accessible it is and how it's possible. And we're not talking about like nation, nation like, you know, nation states and threats and all those sort of things. We're talking about something that is realistic, that someone going out of the dark web spending a few bucks and uh and starting uh you know a budding career in this and they and that is weird for a cyber cybersecurity company to want to tell that type of story but what they wanted to get across is that like these threats are real this stuff happens uh this is how it can be done um and have sort of an empathetic and have sort of an empathetic look at hacking and, and exploring that that's super super interesting so it looks like hack um murder in hr um the hacker chronicles came out first in terms of like was that the first show where yeah. you had a list uh hollywood stars being uh the guests or did you have experience before that with other shows yeah it's a great question. So, so I actually had experience uh, doing this in the past in my previous job or my, so at my previous company, um, geez, what is it? <clears throat> so my previous company, I co-founded a media company and we were making podcasts and a bunch of other stuff. And we were doing nonfiction work with actors, um, a bunch of different really cool actors. And so I had a chance to do that then to work with, with a bunch of different really cool folks like Alec Baldwin oh, and wow. Jeffrey Wright and a few others. Yeah. And so we were doing nonfiction voiceover narration and, and it sort of led me to, to, to where we are now with, uh, with fiction because, uh, you know, I think fiction, nobody's doing it in B2B. Um, yeah, and I think it's, you know, I think it's a huge missed opportunity. It it's it's funny because like we as marketers, we want to control the narrative. We want to control the story. We want to do all this stuff, but nobody wants to make fiction. I'm like, this is your opportunity. <laughs> this is how you do it. Like you can control the entire story. You can That's control true. all the inputs. Um, yeah. We should want to be doing fiction. We should do way more fiction. Um, yeah, you're right. But, um, but we focus on, on nonfiction. So. Yeah. So that previous company was not B two B focus. I think it's called the Mission. I just checked on on is that. Um, and then then you moved to Caspian, and now you're like bringing fiction and other types of shows uh, to B two B world essentially. Yeah. So yeah, it was a uh, it was a network of podcasts and uh, and sort of like a new media company. Uh, there was a bunch of business focus there and a bunch of different types of shows that we were making, but it was very much like a media company. Uh, Caspian is is really different. So we're a services business in the sense that we're like working with B2B marketing Mm. teams to build content for them. And then we're also a production company that is like producing, um, you know, these fiction series, uh, obviously in partnership with, with, uh, with B2B companies. So, um, yeah, it's just a different approach. I think that, um, I think that companies need to be making better stuff. Um, you know, I think that like there's sort of, 
a bunch of different reasons, but just like, you know, we all know B2B content is like pretty boring. Um, and there's just so much room for experimentation, whether it's yeah. with fiction, whether it's with comic books, whether it's with, uh, you know, um, music, you know, there's just so many great examples of people just like pushing it a little bit further, um, mm. and having outsized results and, uh, being more memorable, being more remarkable. You know, I have a podcast called remarkable and the reason why it's called that is because the point of marketing is that you talk about it. It means you <laughs> have to remark about it. You have to like go tell right. someone else. I just saw this thing or I just heard this thing. Like that is the point. Um, it's not good enough just to have it, you know, resonate in that person's heart. You need it to be like something that's so good that they want to tell somebody that they have to tell somebody. And, uh, and there's, and if you, if you honestly look at your work and if you're to use the edutainment graph, if you're to plot your content, how many, and you say like at scale one to 10, how entertaining is it? You're like, yeah, I'm a two. Uh, on a scale of one to 10, how educational? And you're like, eh, it's like a six. It's like, you should not be making that. If it's a two and a six, like, don't make it. Um, nobody like it. wants that. Nobody needs more bad stuff. Like, take the two and the six and figure out how do I get this to an eight out of 10 educationally? How do I get this to a five entertaining wise? Like, what can I do? And then publish it. But if you can't get it there, like, just, you shouldn't do it. That's so true. And the, often the, the pushback I hear is like, well, you know, it's going to take a lot of budget and blah, blah, blah. But like, there's so many tools out there and things and tutorials on YouTube. Like that excuse doesn't fly. Like this whole creator ec like economy and people, um, there's so much tools and cameras gotten cheaper and like yeah. mics has gotten cheaper. Like, like it's, you're totally right. Like there, you, you know, that is getting a lot of things like rolling in my head that I think that it's not an excuse anymore, especially uh, this is not on the list I had in the question, but it's in the back of a lot of B2B marketers mind around AI, you know, like this is how, like, can you talk a little bit about that? I, I feel like this sure. is a perfect way to stand out from bad, like we're going to see a ton more crappy content because people are going to use AI to like create blog posts or other things like that. And, you know, the one that stands out from the rest are ones that do what you're suggesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, uh, you know, first and foremost, like, um, you need to have an angle that starts with the audience that starts mm -hmm. with creativity, like you with marketing power ups, like you have this power ups angle that stems from, you know, clear love of video games and uh, mixing that with sort of like, you know, business knowledge and, and figuring that out. Like you have this angle and you have a clear concept of design and the way that you send the show, show notes, notes for this, this and, uh, you know, the prep talk and all that stuff. Like you have a very, um, so why I was excited to be on the show. Like you have a very defined sort of like brand and thoughts around how like you're building the show. Um, and just so many people lack any type of, uh, creativity or clarity of of a uh, of a of a hook of a premise that can set you apart um that that some reason for being that like your content's reason for being that can like do something that stands out from the crowd and so i think that that's the first and that's like ai is not going to help you with that right it's like ai can figure out you know like for serialized content framework like uh, like AI could have helped me write the book by plugging in a bunch of stuff. Like it could help me write the chapters. And the reason why I didn't do that. And the reason why I didn't like even write chapters in the book is because who cares? Like <laughs> you don't need to go read all those words. Like you really don't. Uh, that's yeah. why like we went extremely uh, visual heavy. We went extremely like list heavy, uh, short explanations, try to have like no words, no paragraphs more than a couple sentences. If you need to 150 words to write a book, like or 150 pages, like dude, you're a bad writer. Like at this <laughs> point, like you know that I always go back to the Mark Twain quote of um, right. Sorry, I wrote you uh, a, a long letter. I didn't. I didn't have time to write you a shorter one. And like that. That's the truth of the matter. Is like more people need to figure out a way to edit their work. This is sounding very you know. Yeah, old man yelling at the cloud sort of thing. But people need to figure out a way to edit their work, not 
shove it into an AI to give you all sorts of, of stuff and then plug that in. You can use the AI as your assistant. That's the best use of AI right now for, for marketing uh, for this stuff. Use it as your assistant. Ask it questions. Have it help you do research. Have it help you refine your ideas. Like, do all that stuff. That's great. But you need to come up with the premise and the ideas yourself uh, to figure out you know what that is. And, you know, I'm a firm believer. There's a great... Um, a writer and podcaster named Jason Concepcion. And he, you know, he's talked about like, there's no such thing as writer's block. There's reader's block. Like if you, you need to go read more, if you can't figure out what to write, like you need to go read more. And I think in the business world, it's like, you need to go talk to customers. You need to go talk to your prospects. You need to figure out what they're asking. You need to go on to, you know, sock channels and things like that and go on to Quora and Reddit, all these places, figure out the questions that they want to know, build a show around that. Make it shorter. Could you do it in seven minutes? Could you do it, you know, could you do something that with faster cuts? Could you do, you know, better editing? Could you distill your information? Uh, I think that uh, the biggest problem with like Chad GPT in my mind um, is just people plugging it in and then cranking out a 1500 word article. Like who, who cares? I, I don't ever want to read a 1500 word article ever for anything. Like no way to tell it to me and tell it to me in, you know, one eighth of the amount of words. Um, because you don't need them all. I know that. That's totally true. I think that the creative piece is something that AI and ChatGPT can't like. It can give you ideas, but like to like come up with a premise, like you mentioned, like to come up with an angle, like that that comes from somebody's experience and somebody's brain and somebody's you know taste with music or videos or whatever. And it really does like. I think that's what I'm hearing here is that. Come on, B2B marketers. You got to get a little bit more creative. Well, and no it'll tell you fly. the words, but like you have to, like with murder and HR, like, you know, you, we could have, we could have asked it to write us a script for that show. And I guarantee you it could have come up with a pretty good script, but that's not the reason why like marketing content you know, that's not the reason why it doesn't get consumed. It, it doesn't get consumed because you have a bad premise, you have bad branding, you have a bad hook, but you're not asking the right questions or answering the right questions. Um, like all of those things like that can't be fixed by, you know, plugging it into AI. You can get a million great ideas from AI, you know, if you're asking it stuff, but um, you need to be able to package that stuff into something that's very digestible uh, for your audience um, and, mm -hmm. and meet them where they are, you know. I like that. You've been talking a lot about premise and hook, and you probably, you know, I, you probably have like produced hundreds of shows already, and you have a taste already of what makes a good premise or a hook for a serialized content. Like, are there certain qualities where you say hell yeah, and some qualities were like that's crap. You need to go back to the the drawing board. Yeah. So first off, like it starts with the audience of, of finding the smallest, most, you know, viable niche audience that you can possibly start with. So like find the person on LinkedIn, find five people on LinkedIn who are the exact type of people that you want to make that show for. What is their job title? What do they do on a day-to-day -day basis? Like, you know, all that stuff. So first it's like, it always starts with audience. Um, and then what is the most important thing that they are seeking information on, right? So um, find that thing, and then create some sort of um, some sort of hook that makes it easy to digest. So you know, listicle works great. You know, three ideas to improve your um, skills as a UI developer. Let's just like use that as an example, right? How would you make a show about that? right? Like what's the show? Are you going to do a long open? Or are you going to do quick cuts? Or are you going to do, you know, how long is it going to be? Why is it going to be long? Um, so I think it's about figuring that stuff out. It's like, well, what are developers like? Oh, they're super into nostalgia or something like that. Right. And they don't like to be sold to, and they don't like, you know, and they like stuff that's super authentic. So why don't we, I, we did this, so I should just oh, use an example. <laughs> so we made this show, um, we made this show uh, that's really cool for developers called, uh, oh, sorry. So we made this show called The Dev Morning Show at Night. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great show. Um, and it's starring Cassidy Williams. She's like an it, uh, awesome developer, evangelist, personality. She's freaking hilarious. And we made it, it as a, a web show that we made for uh, YouTube. And we were like, let's, like let's, let's make a late night talk show, but for developers. and 
it's going to be some somewhere between like a morning show and a, and a late show and it's going to be filmed 100 percent remote and it's going to be cassie's going to be the host and we like crafted a bunch of different stuff and so we made that show and it was super it was super successful i, I think it did like you know like listens on the on the first series on the first season and um yeah, it was just cool. It was fun. It was interesting. It was funny. It was different. It looked different. It had cool visuals. It had all that stuff. Like that to me is a show, right? You saying I'm going to interview our customers, that's not a show, <laughs> right? Like hopping on Zoom and, and interviewing people. So that's what I mean. Like you need that promise to the listener. What are they going to get every time? Are they going to, is it going to be fun? Is it going to be funny? Is it going to be fast paced? Is it going to be a super deep dive into topics? Is it going to be a super deep dive into like one type of topic? Is it going to be, you know, like all that stuff and, uh, you know, and tweak and tweak and tweak mm -hmm. until you get it right. And then keep your format and keep it consistent would be my recommendation for most folks. And I love this is another example of how you bring B2C entertainment to B2B, you know, like that late night talk show. You know, like Jimmy Kimmel, there, you know, people understand that premise, but like bringing in, in like same with murder in HR or like ha the Hacker Chronicles, like I love that concept where like, how do you bring stuff that they enjoy outside of work yeah. into their work? <laughs> so exactly. When they listen to it. It's like, I get it. I understand it. I love it already. Like, you know, how do I get more of it? is what you're doing well with this kind of shows. Yeah, and and Tyler, um, I think it's Lesser, Lessard. From Lesser. Vidyard. Yeah. yeah, from Vidyard. He he has a great phrase, keep them laughing, keep them learning. And and I love that, right? Is like you gotta be funny. And it's mm. so hard to be funny. Like it's really hard to be funny in B2B, right? So you gotta figure out ways to be funny, to add levity. Otherwise it's just boring. And people all the time, which drives me freaking crazy, when people are like, well, accounting is boring. So if I make an accounting <laughs> show, it's boring. Or HR is boring. I'm like, dude, it's not boring to the people who spent their like career right. in this field. Like, you might think it's boring because you're a marketer or trying to create an accounting <laughs> show. But to them, this is their life. This is yeah. their livelihood. This is what feeds their family. This is mm -hmm. what they've spent 20 years doing. You know, they don't think it's boring. They think it's important. Uh, and it is important. So like you need to get past like that sort of idea, but you need to figure out a way to make it more entertaining, um, mm -hmm. to add those things in, to add in drops, to add in, you know, speed, very, you know, very the cadence in which things are delivered, um, you know, set things up. We use a lot of signposting, uh, in, a, in our, in our storytelling of like, you know, um, tell them what is coming show them the sign that's like this okay now we're going to be talking about this mm -hmm. um you know using segments using things like that um like and that. you know you if you go look at your favorite shows like they have that stuff and yeah. some some don't right like rogan does and this is what everyone always says well rogan rogan doesn't or, or tim ferris doesn't um that it's a different utility it's a different type of an interview like the three hour long form type of an interview it has a different utility for the listener that right. listener is just going there to learn some stuff, to be entertained, um, and uh, and they're going there for a different reason. But like, we're not trying to copy Rogan. We're not trying to copy Smartless. Like, these are professional, um, uh, you know, creators that have been doing this for a long time, and uh, and also they have guests that are also professionals that have been doing it for a long time. So, um, I would say, you know, trying to figure out your version of that is is a good call i love that uh that's that we probably can go much further in this but i'm gonna direct people into that ebook that you have it's available on your site i'm gonna link it in the show notes and description you talk more about pillars and what kind of b2b companies should be taking advantage of this and how to do this but i actually want to shift gears and talk about career power-ups things that help you accelerate your career now you've been the founder and CEO of Caspian Studios now for four years. You know, you were at the mission. Before that, you were uh, in the army. I'm curious, what's helped accelerate your career like to where you're at now? It could be people, it could be community, it could be a tactic, it could be anything that's powered up your your career uh, direction. Yeah, I would say, so first off, I would say, you know, I've been fortunate having, you know, I went to, 
to West Point. Um, and so that opens, you know, a lot of doors for you in general because of, of, uh, having a network, um, people once I got out of the army. It's like I got out of the army. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about business. I just knew army stuff. And so it was really, I was fortunate to be able to, you know, tap into my network of, you know, West Point grads. And I got, you know, a lot of, you know, early meetings with people who, you know, frankly, were, were very, very generous with their time of, of humoring all of my little quests and side missions. But, you know, one of the things was the late, great Anthony DeToto, who was a mentor of mine. He would talk about this thing called naive networking. So Anthony uh, was this guy, he was, he was, he worked for like family offices and, you know, managed people's money and, and things like that. So network was everything to him, right? So he had this really cool network and, and he used to, he used to, you know, spend, you know, his entire life networking. And he, you know, he taught me this thing that he, you know, referred to as naive networking, which is basically this, that don't ask for an in-person meeting when a call will do. Don't ask for a call when a email will do. Don't, don't, uh, you know, don't send an email when a text will do. And, um, and always have a clear reason for meeting with a very specific pur purpose. Um, of, I am trying to work out blank. Um, and then, you know, at the end of that sort of asking, like, how can I help you if, the, if there's any way now early in your career, or even sometimes in the middle of your career, like you can't do anything, right? Like, like me as, you know, whatever, a 28 year old, you know, that was out of the army, I really couldn't do anything for anyone, but I would, you know, and he had to be like, Hey, don't worry about it. It'll come back around and, uh, and just, you know, help somebody out the way that it's already, you got helped out. Um, so, you know, early in your career, it, it's really hard to do that. And, uh, but you can still ask, you'd still say, but is there anything that I can do to help you? And it's like, you know, for someone like, you know, Anthony, hey, if you know anyone with, uh, you know, $30 million, then uh, send them my way. Right. Um, I'm like, uh, uh, let me, let me check the role next there. I don't think, That's funny. I don't think I do, but, uh, you know, I'll ask around. So it's a big part about not wasting people's time. It's like, all we have in this world, it's all we have is time. Right. That's like the only thing that we, that, that is every single person, uh, we are losing it every day. Right. So you really don't want to waste people's time and you really want to have clear ask for people of how they can help you. So before you go into that conversation, you need to know what you want and you need to know what you need and you need to know how you can get there. So I spent a lot of time early in my career, sort of like mapping what I needed from people and at being able to ask them for those things, you know, and like, and ultimately like your network, you know, is your net worth thing? Like it is, I think I spent a lot of time early in my career, especially because I was in sales, trying not to be transactional. And I think that it's really hard to do that. But, you know, I had a good, I had a good mentor, my podcast mentor, uh, that, that, uh, is, is, was, you know, one of the lessons that I always remember that they would talk about is, um, uh, you know, sort of like, there's always another deal, right? It's okay mm -hmm. if you lose this, like, that's okay. And so I tried to build my career and I still try to build my career knowing that careers are transactional. There are transactions that need to happen. Like you need to buy something, you need to hire someone, you need to sell something like that is part of it. But the other part of it is you can be devoid, you know, from the outcome and say like, I'm still going to support you. You can still support me. If the deal doesn't get done, the deal doesn't get done, but I still want to be helpful and just always trying to help. And I always tried to use my position of whatever advantage I had to be helpful, to try to help people. So yeah, for Anthony, I didn't know any people with 30 million or more, but it was always my thing that someday when I know someone with 30 million bucks or when I have $30 million, I'll go to Anthony and be able to do that because of the stuff that he did for me. And so, you know, I, I just tried in any, in any way that I could help people, um, I could do that. And then, and the, the big thing with that was like connecting people, right? One of the things that, that senior people are always looking for is young, talented people. So if you have a peer and they don't know young people, so like, if you're like, let's just say a CEO of a, you know, big company, you don't know anyone who's young, like, you, you know, your kids are probably older than, than, than the young people are. Right. So, um, when you are young and you know, other talented people, you can recommend them to be on people's teams. And so that's, that's one of the ways that, uh, I always try to just think of people as like, Hey, do you need a salesperson? Like one of my friends is in sales, like he's really good or you no, know, Hey, this person's in marketing or PR. She's awesome. I can connect you there. So, um, anywho, that's, 
that's my uh, my piece for for naive networking. That's my career power up. Hello, I love that term. Plus, w- the last thing, the last part you mentioned around like introducing people, like when you say, "Hey, do you need a salesperson?" You're actually helping out two people there uh, because that right. salesperson might be looking for a job, and the person that's like a VP of sales or CEO is like actually looking for young talent. So it really does. Um, you know, really people come reach out to me all day, every day. Nobody does that. <laughs> Nobody ever tries to do that for me. I get, you know, hundreds and hundreds of emails a day as a CEO. Nobody ever tries to do that. Hmm. They're never like, it's, it's just like, again, there's no traffic on the extra mile. Like people don't do it. They will not, they will ask you for stuff all the time, but they will not go the extra mile and be like, it looks like you need this. I know someone in this. I'll happy to introduce you to them. Like people just don't do that. And uh, and anyways, that's one of the things I tried to do. That's a good wrap. Like of everything we talked about, there's no traffic, and the last mile is so visual. And you know, it applies to to marketing as well as relationships and and even careers. One final question before we wrap up: Where can people find out more about you? I'm gonna link them Caspian Studios website, Murder in HR Chronicles, Hacker Chronicles. Uh, and any other shows you mentioned, but you know, probably send them to LinkedIn. Like, where else can people find out more about you, your work, your company? Yeah, you know, I would just you know, you can check out CaspianStudios.com. The other thing, uh, we have a pretty good newsletter that I send out every week that uh, you could just subscribe to. But the other thing I would just plug is, so we're building out this murderverse of all these mm-hmm. different, yes, um, all these different personas. So we have murder and sales, murder and marketing. We're going to build out all of these shows over the handful, next handful of years. And so if you know someone, if you're in marketing or if you know someone in marketing who wants to do something really cool, whether it's like IT related or, or marketing or sales or any business function, AI, data, all that stuff, we have really cool pitches ready for uh, people to check out. So if you want to connect with me, I'm Ian at Caspian Studios. Shoot me an email. Um, would love to uh, pitch you some crazy ideas for uh, for some stuff we could do together. I love it. What kind of budgets uh, are you looking at for, for something like that? I mean, it could just be a range, but like just so that people are like, oh yeah, that's right up our budget out. Yeah. Like for, for, I mean, obviously we, we do stuff. Uh, so we have like multiple different services, but so, you know, anywhere in the like 80 K range, we can build a series for you for the fiction stuff. Cause it has, you know, a listers and all that stuff. It's, course, it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's mid, uh, mid six figures. But like I said, 300, 400 grand, somewhere in there. And we can make something really cool. Yeah. And thank you so much for your time. Really, really, uh, I had fun in this conversation. Cool. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. If you enjoyed this episode, you'd love the Marketing Power-Ups newsletter. I share the actionable takeaways and break down the frameworks of world-class marketers. You can go to marketingpowerups.com to subscribe and you'll instantly unlock the three best frameworks that top marketers use to hit their KPIs consistently and wow their colleagues. I want to say thank you to you for listening and please like and follow Marketing Power-Ups on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. If you're feeling extra generous, head to leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Leave a comment on YouTube. It goes a long way in others finding out about Marketing Power-Ups. Thanks to Mary Sullivan for creating the artwork and design. And thank you to Faisal Kaigo for editing the intro video. And of course, thank you for listening. That's all for now. Have a powered up day. Marketing Power-Ups. Until the next episode...